Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Colorado. I'm Nathan Thompson. I'm the CEO and founder of Spectra. And I've had the opportunity opportunity to meet many of you over the years, and I certainly enjoyed the opportunity last night to say hi again and meet several others uh, while you were at our facility to see our Tfinity and our Verde product. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover this week and some quick introductions. So Spectra has been around since 1979, and I'm not certain there is anybody here uh, that's been with it or covering it since 1979. So I'm going to give you some background on how we got to this point and how we have funded the products that you're going to hear about this week. So this is a graph of Spectra from Spectra's revenue from 1979 uh, through our last fiscal year, June 30th, uh, 2013. And uh, if you go back to before 1979, you have zero digits of revenue. And uh, after 2013, we have nine digits of revenue, or over nine digits of revenue. So we are private. We don't, pu uh, we don't publicize our financial information. Uh, but we do give a few highlights. And we have audited financials. Once in a while, we have customers that say, prove it. And we can show them our, our uh, solid financial position. So we're going to zoom in on the modern period or, or what we call the modern period and this is really when we got heavily into tape libraries initially with our AIT tape libraries and then into the LTO and into the enterprise and a lot of our disk products. Um, but last week we did a uh, press release where we talked about our results for 2013 and I'm gonna, going to tell you just a little bit about that. Um, we had a very strong uh, fiscal year, uh, our last fiscal year, we're in FY 2014 now, but we had a 16% revenue growth uh, year over year, a 14% growth in our enterprise libraries, and a 12% growth in our mid-range libraries. Um, with that, we were solidly profitable, and we brought out a new high-capacity archive-grade disk product I'm going to tell you a little bit about later. So his, uh, Spectra has a history of innovation, and this, this chart overlays what percentage of our revenue we have invested in R&D. And this is about twice what the big guys uh, invest per year. Uh, so we really put a lot into R&D. And fortunately, we're, we're profitable, and we've been able to do this year after year. But you, you see a low point of maybe 10% and a high point of 17%. Um, we've been able to use this uh, to really advance our company and stay ahead of our competition. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of our products. Um, uh, this, this is the first tape library we did in the modern area, era post AIT and we used to dominate the AIT market and it really doesn't exist anymore other than some service business but our first big library into um, the LTO space was our T950 and the T950 came out in 2004 and it has uh, contributed over a quarter billion dollars of revenue to Spectra since its inception. Now next to it uh, down to its left you can see that, uh, is a disk product that we built, um, which was a removable RAID product. And it was one of our efforts to get beyond just uh, tape. It was called RXT. Um, this product did not contribute a quarter billion dollars to us. I think, <laughs> I think we, uh, we got it to work. Uh, and we sold 30, and that was about it. So uh, sometimes. Uh, Going forward uh, takes a couple of steps uh, backwards. Um, and as we've gone on, uh, we've continued to innovate, particularly in ways that help our customers achieve more reliability uh, and better 
data integrity, our certified media uh, and our tear pack. Most of the things under this bar, by the way, are software innovations. And after that, we brought out our mid-range T120, which we still sell quite a number of uh, at this point. That's another tape library. Uh, we were the first company to bring encryption to help protect our customers' data uh, from accidental or, or intentional disclosure. Uh, and we built that uh, functionality into our tape libraries. Um, here's another disk product. Um, it uh, did a little better than the one on the left. Uh, uh, it was our interior 700, but it was not an enormous success for us. Uh, but we kept innovating and kept going back and, and making improvements to it. A departmental library, it's very strong for us, the T380 in 2007. Uh, a more uh, kind of an entry-level product called the T50E and the T200 in, in 2008. Uh, media lifecycle management, this sounds like jargon because it is, but it's a product or it's a software product that goes into our, our libraries that tracks the state and quality of our customers' media so they know if they're having a problem well before they lose data. Um, our flagship product, this is the one you saw last night, the Tfinity and another sort of between the department and enterprise library, the T680 in 2009. And then a whole bunch more software innovations, uh, including um, uh, enterprise drive support in our libraries uh, through 2012. And then finally, this archive grade disk product, the Interior Verde, which many of you saw last night, uh, we brought that out in April of uh, last well, of this calendar year of our last fiscal year. So uh, this is a unique product, and we're actually having quite a bit of success with it um, for uh, high integrity applications. So. Um, that's a, that's a quick synopsis of, of where we have been, but let's look at where we're going. So traditionally, um, we have looked at storage as a pyramid. So um, you'll see pyramids. Fred Moore has probably personally created all of them. But uh, you'll see storage as a, a pyramid where at the top of the pyramid you have high performance flash or disk storage. Um, that tends to be lower in capacity and higher in cost. In the middle area of the, the pyramid, you tend to see um, uh, capacity disk, performance disk, but more more there for less dollars per gigabyte. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you may see uh, SATA disk or more commonly tape, which uh, holds the bulk of storage in this storage pyramid. Well, we are uh, uh, we are thinking a little bit different. And so now we really think about storage as deep. And what you're going to hear a lot about today is deep storage. It's different, it's transformative, it's not simple. Somebody says it's all about them. <laughs> yeah, Howard Marks, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, it's, it's not big data or analytics, it's not HSM or ILM, it's not many of the things we've worked with in the past, but it's going to help with all of them. So as simple as it sounds, we're gonna take the whole day to explore our vision and explain our vision of deep storage. So stay with us. We'll open up some opportunities for discussion and questions. We'll push and we'll pull. And I think by the end of the day, you'll have a new perspective on some old problems. And even maybe some ideas on new business models that will be made possible. But the vision has not been created in a vacuum. Deep storage has been developed in conjunction with many of our customers. You'll hear from several of them today. Deep storage has been created to meet the needs of these and many more customers. I feel that deep storage can best be described through six attributes. Uh, first of all, deep storage has a REST interface. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this and you'll learn a lot more through the day. It is persistent. It is cost effective, it is efficient, it is secure, and it is easy to integrate and deploy. And I'll take a few minutes from a customer perspective and actually one from a personal perspective to describe these, these six attributes. So deep storage uses REST 
or an interface that's called RESTful. And REST is a subset of HTTP. So when you are using a browser and you pull a PDF file down from a, a website, you are using a REST get command. Similarly, if you put an image, say, up on Facebook, you're using a REST put command. It's really simple. Now, the history of interfaces is a little less simple. I'm going to tell you what this is and why it's different from, from uh, other traditional interfaces. And I'm going to try to tell it from the perspective of one of our customers, a large um, supercomputing site that is a university consortium that does weather and climate research. And this user has over 100 petabytes. <coughs> So the supercomputer this user has is connected to block storage. It uses essentially a SCSI protocol, but it's networked over a switch, a fiber channel switch. And so this is block storage. This site allows its local researchers to access and use the data by way of a NAS interface or networked attached storage interface connected via, via a LAN using protocols like NFS and CIFS. But where they're going is they wish to add a private cloud. Now, deep storage isn't only about private cloud, but in this case, it, it, it really does apply and enable a private cloud. And they're using the, the REST or HTTP interface. And their goal is to allow their worldwide researchers to contribute and store their data and their results in this cloud without uh, charging them for it. And it's a very cost-effective system that, that we're working with, uh, working with them on. And uh, their goal is to use their existing web infrastructure, the switches, the routers, the gateways, the firewalls um, that are in place, but be able to create this, this private cloud for this weather research. So deep storage is the perfect fit for this kind of application, and it's accessed by REST. Deep storage is persistent which means that it can be maintained virtually forever. It is scrubbable, meaning that you can verify it, and protected against bit rot and corruption through error detection and correction systems. Deep storage can be copied to new media types as they become available, or old media becomes obsolete. As a customer example, Spectra has worked with a few large petroleum exploration and production companies, one of which has over 70 petabytes of seismic data. Seismic data is, is as valuable now as it will be 100 years from now due to the emergence of new technologies which will allow more oil and gas to be unlocked from known reserves. These petroleum companies are working with Spectra to evaluate using deep storage for their seismic archives. The advantages include their seismic data will not degrade due to bit rot or corruption. The integrity of the seismic data can be periodically and automatically verified. Metadata is stored with the seismic data. And seismic and metadata in deep storage can be migrated to new media as better or less expensive technologies become available. So deep storage is a great fit for storing seismic data because it was created for persistence. Deep storage is cost effective. It costs between one fifth and one fiftieth the cost of traditional deep storage, uh, of traditional disk storage. Because of this, deep storage will uh, will transform existing and future storage intensive applications. As a customer example, Spectra recently met with an online digital uh, photograph storage company. And this company had over 120 petabytes of customer images. Their business model dictates that they store their users' photographs forever. And with a growing number of users, a growing number of photographs per user, and a growing size in pixels per photograph, this company is facing exponential growth in storage costs. Another problem they face is the cost of storage management software. As their storage grows, they're paying linearly for their storage management software. And the cost has been too high. 
So deep storage is a perfect fit when cost is important. It will transform existing applications and enable the creation of myriad new applications by eliminating the high barriers of high cost storage and high cost storage management software. Deep storage is energy efficient and I define efficiency as a system's cost effectiveness after the upfront purchase. Efficiency includes low power consumption, high, st high uh, storage density, scalability, low cost of maintenance, operator efficiency, and a host of other factors. Now, many of you probably saw the Wall Street Journal article about the NSA melting down uh, for the 13th time in, uh, in 12 months. There might be some good news in there. Uh, that, uh, uh, the bad news is they're not using our stuff, but uh, uh, oh, maybe that's the good news, yes. Um, that Tfinity that you saw last night, uh, the giant Tfinity was consuming 1,700 watts of power. Now that's a, that's a slightly contrived case because it only had five tape drives in it, but um, you could add a lot of tape drives and, and it wouldn't make a big difference. Uh, yet it contained one eighth of an exabyte. And the estimate on the NSA data site is it contains an exabyte. Now that may or may not be correct. The uh, Verde disk system that you saw that was all the way down at the end of the room, um, it, it is super efficient in terms of power efficiency uh, in storage density. It had approximately 1% of the storage of the Tfinity library that you saw. So, so 1 one hundredth of the, the usable storage of that Tfinity. Um, it will always use more power. It, it would be around five to six kilowatts of power than that Tfinity fully equipped with, with tape drives uh, and uh, tape cartridges. So that just gives you a sense of the, the difference in energy efficiency for some of these technologies. So as a customer example, we work closely with multiple uh, cable TV content providers. And one in particular maintains a 50,000 cartridge archive. And I don't think this is real un uh, unique. It has 50,000 cartridges of, that are videotapes from old programming that still has a lot of value. And many of these videotapes uh, reside on old aging analog tape. So as they digitize this, this content, they need an efficient way, given their data center and their power capabilities, to store it. In a purely disk solution, the system would require over 10,000 of the latest and highest capacity disk drives. And this poses for this customer a large concern about energy cost, heat and cooling, floor space, software maintenance cost, storage maintenance cost, and operator involvement. A video archive of this size really can't be managed very well with, with traditional disk storage. And we're hearing this from not just a few of our customers, but dozens and dozens of our customers in this space. But deep storage is a perfect fit due to its low purchase and operating costs. It makes digital video archive possible. Deep storage is secure. Uh, as a customer example, we have been working, Spectre has been working with two government health agencies. Both have over 30 petabytes of storage and expect growth in capacity. These agencies have high capacity needs and rigorous security requirements due to the long-term tracking of patient disease and drug information. Deep storage uses encryption for security. And with deep storage, you can encrypt at the client level. You can encrypt using HTTPS from the client to the deep storage server. You can encrypt inside the deep storage server. And you can encrypt on the deep storage media, the storage media itself. So the secure nature of deep storage makes it a perfect fit for these medical and healthcare applications. And finally, 
Deep storage is fast and easy to deploy. Uh, last night I was talking to John Twego, and uh, we were talking about how few college grads know how to enable uh, or how to use tape. And um, that made me think about my 18-year-old son um, who has taken high school computer science, and one of his great loves is a GoPro camera. And he videos everything, every ski run he makes, every skateboard run, driving his car, he puts the camera all over the place. And he's filled up nearly every storage device in our house with his uh, GoPro um, camera videos. In a couple hours of work, he could create an app that copies his GoPro files out to deep storage using this REST interface or a Java API uh, that we will provide. And um, I don't know that he'll do it, but it's just an example that it, it, it uh, you know, it doesn't take a college education to use this level of product. So as a customer example, two years ago, we worked with a government contractor who stored video that came from UAVs, or as they like to call them, airborne assets. And this project would accumulate over 300 petabytes of imagery transferred over satellite links. The contractor knew that disk was impractical at 300 petabytes, but designing an application that used tape would take two years and work through to, to work through all of the SCSI commands, air conditions, and other challenges associating with programming to block protocols. And that just wouldn't work uh, due to the project timelines. Using deep storage protocols, the contractor could avoid the multi-year effort of writing low-level block protocol software and could implement and deploy the storage portion of the project in a matter of months. Deep storage is the perfect fit when time to market is important. So these are the six attributes of deep storage. But before I turn you over to the rest of the day, I want to tell you about the team that invented deep storage. And as usual at Spectra, we have the usual suspects, Matt and Hossein and Molly and Brian, um, but we have, have assembled some very deep technical talent over the years. And um, this is actually a picture of a laser fusion experiment from one of our customers, Sandia National Labs. And I use fusion as a metaphor for how we successfully fused together so much technical talent to bring this out. So, Spectra is well known as a hardware, storage hardware manufacturer, but we, we maintain a deep bench, a deep bench, pardon me, we maintain a deep bench of software developers. If you go way back, we created a massive storage product called Alexandria. And somebody was actually asking about that. It might have been Eric Slack or, or George last night was asking about that. And we sold that division in 1999, but we were able to, to keep several of the developers, the core developers of this product, and um, within a year of selling the division, we were able to hire a number of them back. So we have this deep uh, understanding of, of storage management through the Alexandria team. 2001, we brought in a guy who was really the, the brainchild of the uh, interface, and he has built uh, really the web method of protocol for, for deep storage, and he's built a very strong um, software foundation within Spectra over the years and has contributed uh, substantially to this. Some of this comes from a little bit of time with, uh, in the mobile phone industry. Um, in 2009, we brought aboard the president of the Free BSD Foundation and several of his cohorts. And this group has really brought together um, the underlying operating system, uh, all of the software that we use, the drivers, the disk storage um, systems, et cetera, that go together to, to build deep storage. Uh, as many of you know, we, we brought in a couple of key leaders of the company formerly known as Storage Tech in 2011 uh, by way of Oracle, by way of Sun. And um, 
um, these two guys have really changed our company, have given us the ability to understand storage much more from an enterprise standpoint and, and bring in a number of, of strong developers and contributors into the team uh, to, to bring this forward. Uh, in 2007, um, we, we started gaining a few people from Pillar. Pillar has a local Boulder facility and we've continued to gain um, some uh, Pillar talent and they've really helped us with the high capacity ease of use associated with some of these storage products. And then one guy, I don't quite know how to fit him in, but uh, he's the, I guess I'll call him the compellent Dell factor, and that's Bruce Kornfeld, and he, he joined us to really help us uh, understand how to explain and launch this product, and many of you guys uh, ha have met him. So the fusion of these ideas from this diverse talent pool is responsible for what you will hear about and learn about today. And I'd like to introduce you to some of our speakers who will follow me. Um, first of all, uh, Molly Rector. Uh, Molly is the Chief Marketing Officer and the Executive Vice President of Product Management uh, and Worldwide Marketing. And Molly and I spent many, many weekends in my living room uh, talking about what the heck is this? We knew what we had invented from a technical standpoint, but how do you describe it? And so uh, we, we worked through that, and uh, Molly is going to uh, follow me. Uh, Brian Granger, our executive uh, vice president of sales, uh, we call him the big guy. I'm sure you guys get that. Um, and uh, he runs all of our sales and our, our sales operations. Uh, John Benson. Um, who is the VP and General Manager of Emerging Technologies and Software, uh, runs all of the uh, development for our emerging products and, the, and um, most of our software efforts at Spectra. And Dave Tracy, the Senior Director of Emerging Technologies. Dave um, is really the, the core uh, team lead and, and architect, uh, along with some, some other good architects with him uh, working in his teams that have defined and built uh, deep storage, and several of the pieces we'll show you. So with that, I'd like to welcome up Molly.